Hey friends, before we start this episode of Do You Even Movie, we want to take a moment to mention a very exciting new release. We have a book coming out. We do indeed. Which is shocking because David cannot read. That's not true. But it's called Welcome to Prime Time, the unofficial Freddy's Nightmares Companion. Yes. And it's based on a year and a half of research and interviews that you and I conducted. Yes, it was. Before we started doing Do You Even Movie. In fact, I would guess at least half of the listeners and viewers of Do You Even Movie started out watching or listening to us on Welcome to Primetime. Yeah. Well, the book is now available for pre-order to get a signed copy at deathcultpress.com. The link will be in the show notes and et cetera, et cetera, but it's yep. at deathcultpress.com. $20 gets you the book. We're really excited. Uh, it's been covered on iHorror. Yeah. It's been covered on Rue Morgue. It's been covered on Joe Blow. Joe Blow. So there was another one. There was a fourth one. And now I can't bloody remember. Disgusting. Bloody disgusting. There we go. Yeah. Yes. That's why I was doing all the talking yes. guys. It's because Dave is worthless, but, uh, <laughs> but no. So if you get a chance, please check out the book. And of course, if you don't have time to get the pre-order in, in April, it will be available on Amazon to buy in paperback. I think you guys would really dig it as much as we dug doing it. Yes. It was a lot of fun to do and we're happy that it's out now. So make sure you check that out. April 1st is uh, when copies will be available elsewhere, but you can pre-order it right now, uh, except for the limited editions. Oh, they're all gone. They're <laughs> long gone kids. Gosh, I'm oily looking. Uh, that's just part of the game, there we but, go. uh, but no, so, uh, check that out. And a big thank you to Jeffrey Turner who co-authored the book yes, with absolutely. us and he's the head honcho over at death cult press. And while you're there, if you love reading books about movies, Check out some of his other books, including two official Night of the Living Dead books. Yes, I highly recommend, uh, what is it, uh, Tapes of the Living Dead. That is, a, that is a lot of fun. It's Night of the Living Tapes. Night of the Living Tapes. Well, I I had it half right. What saddens me is uh -huh. that's the peak for you. <laughs> half right. It's half right. Half right. All right. I mean, I'll take that for now. <sighs> anyway, <laughs> uh, on with the show. Wayne's World, Mighty Tabs, excellent! Wayne's World, the movie. No way. Way. Don't just see it. Get the net. Live it. It makes me feel kind of funny. Like when we used to climb the rope in gym class. Smell it. I'm just glad there was no need for a body cavity search. Be it. Hi, Wayne. Paramount Pictures presents Wayne's World. We're not mental or anything, so don't be afraid. Wait at PG-13. Starts Friday, February 14th. That suit is everywhere. In a world where podcasts reign supreme, two friends dare to ask, do you even movie? Hosted by filmmaker Enrique Couto and movie aficionado David D. Neuer. Spoiler alert. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Do You Even Movie? Uh, party on, Dave. Party on, Hen. <laughs> Tonight we're talking about a, a classic comfort yes. film. Uh, a film that, as a 90s kid and as a fake 90s fake kid, 90s kid. Uh, as, but as a 90s kid, Wayne's World was one of the coolest. That was a film that when you watched it and you were a little kid, you you were you were being cool. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because that was it was adult humor, but it I mean, was it? Um but I mean no, because it's a silly movie. It's, it's a, a really movie. fun movie. I mean, come on, they do a Terminator 2 joke. Yes, they do. Yes, but they, they but, do. No, no, but that's yes, the Terminator 2 joke is my favorite thing in the world. But yeah, yeah. my point is they do a Terminator 2 joke when he's about to go and run and and tell his love interest that he actually loves her. Yeah. So that's the kind of film we're talking about. Yes, it's a movie it is. where he's like, I have to tell her how I feel. And then they throw <laughs> a, a almost Zucker Brothers joke in. Yeah. In between. And it's that's one of the reasons that the movie really holds up to me. So good. It's just so, so much fun. So, and uh, I, I'm not trying to throw you under the bus, but Dave has been going through some times. Yes, I have. And uh, how much you want to talk about that is completely up to you. I mean, but uh, I, I was planning on, on saying some oh, stuff. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I, I was just, I was just no, going to no. keep it no, you know, vague and mainly, stuff. So. Mainly, I wanted to address, uh, for, the, for, the last, uh, for the last couple episodes, you may have wondered why maybe it felt like I was a little off and whatnot. No one noticed because I was so tired. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, so unfortunately about, about two weeks ago, I found out that my great grandmother had passed. Um, and that was, that was hard enough, but that was also in the midst of, uh, unfortunately my partner and I broke up, my girlfriend and I broke up, um, of about four year relationship and, uh, she had to move out of the apartment. 
Well, and unfortunately, it was between paydays, so you couldn't get her a gift. <laughs> I mean, it was not not to get too personal. But oh it gosh, was, I was just trying to be funny. No, no, you're fine. It was three days before Valentine's Day and about Solid a move. week and a half before her birthday. So, Solid move. Yeah, that was not awesome. No, and no, it's it, it's 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 never easy. Uh, no. uh, if if people are new to the show, they're gonna be like, "Why is this dumbass making jokes all the time?" Yeah, that's all I do. That's what he does. But no, no, but it's been rough, yeah. and uh, so I remember. When we were talking about movies we were picking, yeah. you were looking forward to this one being on the rotation right in the midst of, yeah. of your living situation yes, changing. absolutely. And I, uh, was like, not to brag, mm-hmm. but I'm just generally in a living hell. Yeah. So, uh... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I, I, you know, I'm going through a lot. My dog is, uh, my I lost one dog and my other dog is not, not doing super and I'm overworked and uh, uh, <laughs> in it's, every it's direction. What did you say? I said it's tough out there right now. It's it's tough out there right now. So, uh, but no. <laughs> so so oh, I gotta say something. All right, I should not. Okay, and that makes me want to say it so bad. Okay, there are people out there. Okay, so one of the things that makes me mad, I'm a business owner. Yes, okay? you are. I own a small business. I own a production and distribution company. Yes, you do. And I don't know if you've heard about this, but the but inflation is up. Very much so. But I've. I found people that be- that that think it's just that like the prices are just going up because the companies wanna. No, clearly, yeah. I mean that that and, would to- make total sense. And all I'm saying is, <laughs> as a business owner who charges prices for things, yeah. and makes a certain amount of money, all of the savings, all of the plans, the the value of your money is deteriorating. People, mm-hmm. and this is not, believe it or not, I don't have like a cash for gold. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, thing. I wish I did. Yeah. Use use co- promo code Henny thinks the world's going to end for twenty percent off at checkout. But no, no. Uh, <laughs> but but no, I I it 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 ticks me off, and I I think a lot of people are ticked off. You know, your groceries are more expensive. The money you saved, you're just a fool because. All of our money is declining in value. Yeah. And the reason I'm even talking about this is because two things blow my mind. One is when people are mad about how much money people are making, themselves yeah. and others are making, but they're never mad about inflation. Yeah. They, they never stop to go, but why is our money worth less yeah. every year? Now, this is not an anti-government rant. I'm just saying, like, that on top of all the other bullshit yeah, it sucks. Ha- has kept me grouchy. Yeah, I completely get that. But what keeps me less grouchy... No, no, hold on. There are people who are oh saying that God. it's corporate greed. They're saying that, no, no, they're saying that it's corporate greed is why the prices are up. So what, is there a greed index? Is it like the dew point on the weather report? Is is there, like when you want a plane ticket to Arizona and you're like, oh crap, if I book it right now, it's only 180 bucks. Is the airline less greedy that day? <laughs> or are markets actually a thing? Yeah. And that just blows my mind. It blows my mind. Maybe I'm on Twitter too much, but I mean, it, it, it's possible. It just blows my mind to hear people say like, "This is corporate greed." And I'm like, ah. So when prices were low, they weren't greedy. Yeah, I miss the days of all the major corporations being just menches to us. Menches to us. Give yeah. me a break. I'm sorry. I just I had to get that off my yeah. my chest. So if you out there <laughs> listening or watching think that corporate greed is why everything is more expensive. Uh, literally read any book. Yeah. It will help you. Yeah, well. um, or better yet, just don't listen to, to, to anybody who says you should listen to them. Don't listen to them. In fact, especially don't listen to me. <laughs> that all being said, Wayne's World Wayne's World was a cable mainstay when I was a young man. Yeah. It was on Comedy Central all the time and USA Network all the yeah. time. But I mean, like it was on when you were a kid too, but you oh, gotta... Yeah. This is a lot of times with the show, we have to talk about our age difference because well, I mean, it's such, such a major let's just element. Say this Wayne's world literally came out the year I was born. I know it's the, it, like, I'm glad something good came out of that year. You leave uh, 1992 alone. It's a good year. I actually like 1992. You're the only, uh, the only bad, the only bad thing about it. It's okay. Like, thanks Ma- bud. Like Mount St. Helen erupted the day I was born or something. It's Jesus. so I'm not even joking. <sighs> September 10th, 1986, baby. Yeah. Some stuff that went is, down. That is true. And Mojo Nixon played a show that day. I have a flyer for the show. RIP Mojo. Rest in peace, Mojo Nixon. But anyway, so I am I am a little full of piss and vinegar, but <laughs> you don't say. But I do love Wayne's World, and I've always enjoyed it. I remember growing up, my older sister yeah. laughing at the humor at the diddly do diddly do diddly do, and, and I remember kids in school going swing and stuff like that, <laughs> which was so inappropriate. The best part about the swing thing, yeah, was 
we didn't know what it was even what it, what it meant. Yeah. It was just a silly, funny sound. Yeah. So you would do it in like middle school and get fucking suspended. Well, it's like the, I remember <laughs> when uh, the, the Spy Who Shagged Me came out and uh, it was just like it was, you know, it was being previewed on TV and it was coming out and we're sitting around the dinner table one night and I was just like, I like fat bastard. Not knowing that bastard was a was a bad word at that. point. I have a similar story, but it has nothing to do with the movie. I just ran around the house yelling bastard when I was four years old. I went to a Christian <laughs> uh, elementary school only through like preschool and kindergarten and and uh, my, I got sent home with a note because uh, Hey Arnold was popular at that point, and I said Bucko, and it <laughs> sounded too much like Fucko. Apparently, I thought you were like I got sent home with a note. It just said Return to Sender. <laughs> no. Uh, luckily, I was in uh, public school always, so they were like, eh. So he's fucked up. So is everybody. Yeah, Let mean, him die. You know, fair. welcome to public <laughs> schools. That's fair. But, Jesus Christ. But no, no, no. It. it... <laughs> I'm having fun with this one. Yeah. I no, I am too. But. Do you want do you want me to save my my big Wayne's World uh so uh, rumor? Let's save that. Let's save that when we get to our first time and we'll get into the pertinent deets on this and then we'll work our way down. Okay, I mean I just have a, Actually, a you know first what? hand. No, fuck it. No, Throw no, it out. Let's do it. You want to Okay, yeah, so Yeah, do it. No, no, no. I've been I've been dying to hear this so story. So for those who don't know about Wayne's World. Yes. Wayne's World is a fictional cable access show out of Aurora, Illinois, where these two guys are broadcasting in their basement. Yep. And they, they're they're uh, what I would call metal nerds because mm -hmm. they're not cool. Mm -mm. They sound like they could be cool, but then when you see them next to other metalheads, you're like, oh, these guys are dorks. Yeah, they'd get they're beat dweebs. Up. They'd get beat up. You know, they they like Dio. Yeah. You know, that's really the dividing mark. Is that like, is actually you, a really good dividing mark. If yeah. you like Dio, then it's you get they a swirl. They never really address like anything like tabletop or anything in the in the movie, like any gaming or anything no, like that. I, well that was this is the nineties, dude. Like yeah, that, true, that true. was that was kinda that was kinda, kinda over to an extent. Yeah, no, no, it was over. Ending, yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh but that being said, I came up in cable access television. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, public access is different from cable access. Yes, it that's is. something I had to deal with a lot. I worked for public explaining. access explaining. Well, public access is publicly funded television. Mm -hmm. Community access and cable access television is literally the community's programming. Yeah. And that's how, I mean, the first set I was ever on, the first camera I ever used was provided by communi a community access station. Yeah. Well, there is a, I don't know if you call it a rumor, at this point a legend. Probably a legend, yeah. That Wayne's World was based on a Dayton, Ohio area cable access show. God, I could see that. Called Andy and Pat's Groovy Cosmic Love Hour. <laughs> because Andy and Pat, you I mean they they were around all through the 90s too. Yeah. Andy and Pat did their show all the time in the late 80s and early 90s. There were major comedy clubs in the Dayton area. Which is where they think that the idea like floated into possibly Dana Carvey's brain. Yeah. Because we had Joker's Comedy Club at that time and then also Wiley's, Wiley's which is kind of our yep. famous one as well. Yeah. But, but big names came to those places. Oh, all the time. Um, so I don't know if Mike Myers ever came through or not. I have no idea. But I, I know Dana Carvey did because I filmed a movie at Wiley's Comedy Club and his picture's on the wall with a Hell signature. Yeah. So there has been a rumor because Andy and Pat's Groovy Cosmic Love Hour was live and it was these two guys, Andy and Pat. Uh, Andy Valeri and Pat Cook. I worked on Andy and Pat's Groovy Cosmic Love Hour a couple of times. <laughs> and they would do this live talk show and you could call in and talk about whatever you wanted. And one of the things I really liked about Andy and Pat was they were unflappable. So you would just call in and you would be like, yeah, so uh, I'm trying not to get my sister pregnant when we have sex. What do we do? My and, God. And, Pat, and Pat would just be like, well, I mean, barrier methods are the most... Uh, the most reasonable you want to have a condom but you have to have water-based lubricant he would just do that oh my god he would like not give them the satisfaction. the satisfaction so the only time they'd hang up is if you just started uh spamming swear words yeah. then they just hang up and be like next yeah, call you can't do that, but if yeah. you called in and just tried to shock them pat would just deadpan be like all right well um the best way to handle that he would just do it that way that's amazing so but after wayne's world because this was years before wayne's world the skit yeah which was a skit on Saturday Night Live. For years after Wayne's World, people would call in and ask, like, are you in your are you are you broadcasting from your basement? Are you this and that? And people had always thought it was a Wayne's World inspiration. Yeah. When in reality, there's no proof that this inspired Wayne's World. But it was way before Wayne's World. It had a very similar vibe. It didn't have the silly 
weird conglomeration yeah. of Chicago and and Canadian metalheads. That no, I mean that's one of the things no, that no, makes that, Wayne's World so fun. Is it, like, yeah. is they're very clearly Canadian. Oh yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. Is Dana Carvey Canadian? Uh, I don't think he is. Uh, I, well, but Mike Myers is Canadian, Mike, uh, yeah, and it's his pet project. Yeah. So, but yeah. So the the legend has always been that some comedian who worked on SNL or Dana Carvey himself or somebody was hanging out in their hotel room after they did a show. Yeah. Because Andy and Pat's Groovy Cosmic Lover was almost always on after midnight. Oh wow! That's so. A good time. They would, they would, they had watched it or maybe even saw it a few times yeah. because they came through town and that, that just kind of permeated into a little, a little nugget of this idea of like, what if we had two goofy guys doing a live public access show? And then, you know, Mike Myers puts his spin on it. Dana Carvey puts his spin on it. Yeah. Lauren Michaels puts his spin on it. Some of the legends are that Lauren Michaels, that's what, that. one of the versions I heard was that Lauren Michaels was in town watching comedy at Wild. Oh, I could totally see that. Because he did scout talent. Yeah. And that he in his hotel room, that's the big, the big. That would make the most sense. And here's where the plot thickens, okay. my boy. Some of the legends. Now, when I say legends, I mean, I heard this from like one person down from like, it's it's been a, a, a Dayton mystery for a long time. Yeah. Some people even think the whole concept of Mr. Big seeing their show was like a thinly veiled reference to Lorne Michaels seeing their show in his hotel room. That makes a hell of a lot of sense. And going, we should do something like that. Yeah. And it's important to mention that when I say this, I'm not trying to uh, mind for clout and say like, they stole that. I No, they did nothing like Andy and Pat's other than the very, it, that would be like, Getting mad because you had you worked at a bagel shop, yeah. And Lorne Michaels saw you at the bagel shop, and then went, "I want to do a skit about a bagel shop." It's not your bagel shop. It's yeah. not you. It's not based on you. No, absolutely. And Andy and Pat were not at all like the Wayne's World. Yeah, not like Wade's Wade's World. World. They were very chill. They liked to to play old music. Yeah, and take calls. That's awesome. So. But and a shout out to Andy and Pat wherever you are. Absolutely, actually, I know I know exactly where both of them are. They're both <laughs> alive, and I assume well. Uh, but we, we hope for their well. <laughs> but I I I mean I was uh, I helped them. They did one time. They did like a like an uh, like a six hour stream, Damn. and I was on. I was one of the crew. Oh, no, it was they did the groovy cosmic cookout. Oh, I remember because you they had a they had a camera outside for the grill. So that they could see people getting them. And That's it's one so of the, good. it's one of the only times in the world I have photos of my dad because uh my dad was in town on visitation. Yeah. And I was like, I can't miss this live thing. I want to be there. I want to work on the show. Absolutely. So my dad just had to hang out with all these weird miscreants who were like only slightly younger than him. That's the other thing. I'm, 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 I'm paint the picture right. Mm -hmm. I'm maybe 14. Okay. Probably 13. Yeah. I, all my friends were in their freaking late twenties when I was a teenager. Yeah. So anyway, that is a piece of Dayton, of, of Dayton history. You I might really, never hear anywhere. I really, really hope it's true because I do have something when we get to the facts towards the end of the show that goes a little bit into the creation of Wayne's world, but it does not signify any of that, but we'll see. I mean, I think, I mean, I would not be, if it were true. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if no one even remembers no. that because it's just yeah. a spark of an idea. Yeah. But no legend. Legend. That's a legend. Legend is thing. the perfect way to describe that, and I really hope it's true. <laughs> legend has it, it, the concept was invented in Dayton, Ohio, which is the the Paris of Ohio. The Paris of Ohio. Yeah, this so, is true. Uh, but now let's get into the pertinent deets on 1992's Wayne's World. Wayne's World, 1992, one hour and thirty four minutes, rated PG thirteen for sex related. Dialogue. It really is related. <laughs> so our director is Penelope Spheris. Uh, she started out her directing career in 1981 with a famous documentary that is uh, part one of three, The Decline of Western Civilization. Have you ever seen it? The, no, I have not. The punk documentary it has uh, germs is in it. Uh, it focuses on the band X. Steve Germs? No, not Steve Germs. Oh. Uh, Circle Jerks, <laughs> uh, X, and um, the, Fear. The social media company X no, is not, in it? No, not the social <laughs> No, these are all punk bands out of the L.A. scene at this point. Oh, you could have been clearer. Oh, my God. Anyway, she starts that in 81, <laughs> uh, very well known for that. Then she goes to work for Corman on Suburbia in 1983, which she was a writer on. Roger Corman, the king of the B-movie. Uh, then she shoots the boys, or she uh, directs The Boys Next Door in 1985 with, uh, it's uh, Charlie Sheen and uh, Rex Manning from Empire Records. I can't think of his name. Wait, The Boys Next Door? The, the serial killer movie. Yeah, oh, she man. She directed that. 
Ah, I want to rewatch that. Hollywood Vice Squad, 1986. She directs Megadeth's Wake Up Dead video in 87. Dudes in 1987. Then Dudes? Does the, you haven't seen Dudes with John Cryer and I think Dan Roebuck? I have not. Oh, we're going to have to watch a dude soon. Uh, Decline of Western Civilization Part 2, The Metal Years in 1988, directs Night Rangers, Did It for Love video in 88, Megadeth in Darkest Hour in 88, Megadeth No More Mr. Nice Guy in 1990, the video for Shocker. All right, now we're talking about a feature film. Thunder and Mud in 1990, Prison Stories, Woman Inside 91, UFO Abductions 91, Visitors from the Unknown in 91, then Wayne's World in 1992. She went down a, a rabbit hole of, yeah. of trashy syndicated television. Yes, she did. And she, like, she hey, was I said that with love. She, she, she was known for documentaries, so if they could give her like true to life stuff, they would. Uh, okay. Which is interesting because 92 is when she does Wayne's World, then she does Danger Theater in 93, the Beverly Hillbillies movie in 93. I love the Beverly Hillbillies it's good. movie. Then she writes and directs The Little Rascals in 1994. I adore The Little uh, Rascals. I love The Little Rascals too. That one I mean, was so good. Black Sheep, 1996, Chris Farley and David Spade movie. The the movie that was basically Tommy Boy, but Tommy, Tommy Boy, Boy was, yeah. was after. Yep. Decline of Western Civilization Part 3 in 98, Senseless 98, Holly Weird 99, We Sold Our Souls for Rock and Roll 2001, The Kid and I in 2005. Are you familiar with The Kid and I, by the way? I haven't seen this, and I'm and I'm, I'm not it. familiar. So it's a movie apparently about a kid that like loves Schwarzenegger so much, like specifically True Lies, that he basically starts recreating the movie. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Okay. We're going we're gonna to have to check that one out. Balls yeah. to the Wall 2011, 5 2011, The Real St. Nick in 2012, um, and that was basically the end of her career as it stands right now, but she has been doing a lot of pro uh, producing work for the most part. What a wild career, going oh. from documentary to, like, major. But oh, not just, just But not, hold on, though, but not just, not just narrative movies, yeah. but hit movies. Yeah. I mean, The Little Rascals was everywhere. Well, and uh, I will say, uh, so Decline of Western Civilization Part 3 has nothing to do with music except for she follows these kids around that are basically homeless in the uh, L.A. late punk scene and whatnot. She actually ended up adopting one of the kids by the end of production. That's like, creepy. She's a, she's a, no. She's well, it wouldn't be creepy. It would be creepy if she was a man. She's not a man. How do you know? Oh, my God. Moving on. <laughs> Writer on this is Mike Myers. We'll get to him when we get to the actors here in a bit. Um, Bonnie and Terry Turner are the writers credited on Wayne's World for the screenplay. They started on The Bill Tush Show in 1980, landed SNL in 1986, the movie Funland in 1987. Funland. Uh, it's one of those movies that is like a DVD you've seen everywhere that has a clown with a machine gun on it. Funland? Funland. I've never seen it, but I've seen that, that cover everywhere. That's not the one directed by Michael Simpson, is it? Uh, let Michael me check. A. Simpson? Let me the check. Di famously, the director of Sleepaway Camp 2 and 3 and Fast Food with... Uh, uh, Michael A. Simpson. There you go. I am awesome. <laughs> I, I actually, uh, I got a hold of a copy of Funland and Fast Food. I've never seen them. Ooh. I wanted to see Michael A. Simpson's other work. We need to watch that, definitely. So uh, he does Funland in 87, Wayne's World in 92, they write Coneheads in 93, they write Wayne's World 2 in 93, She TV in 94, The Brady Bunch Movie in 1995. Freaking love that Brady Bunch movie. Tommy Boy in 1995. Weird. <laughs> then hold on. <laughs> they start writing on Third Rock from the Sun in 96. They're the creators of that 70s show in 1998. Are you serious? They wrote on Days Like These in 99, Normal Ohio in 2000, the short-lived That 80s Show in 2002. The short-lived Whoopi in 2003. Wow. That 90 show, 2023. Wow. Well, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that, I was not expecting that turn. Oh, and now let's get to the cinematographer, which is Theo Van Desan. He starts with a career in Dropout, in, or the film Dropout in 1969, Naked Over the Fence in 70, uh, 1973, Q&Q &Q in 1974, The Debut 77, Charlotte 80, The Girl with Red Hair in 81, Darlings in 84, Private Resistance 85, The Assault in 86, Crossing Delancey in 88, then in 1988, shoots Miracle Mile. I'm not familiar with Miracle Mile. Miracle Mile is a movie with, uh, uh, it's the, uh, Anthony Edwards is a guy that is, he's out in LA and he gets a call on a payphone with this guy basically saying that, that we've sent a missile off, the world's going to end at this point, and the rest of the movie is him telling people and everybody basically losing their minds and also accepting that they're going to die. So... Fun for the whole family. It's a good movie, and it's such an uplifting movie. Oh, my God. <laughs> Rooftops in 1989. The First Power in 1990. Now we are cooking. Uh, we're not cooking yet. Just wait, sir. Oh, dear. Okay, I'm Once ready. Around in 1991. Body Parts in 19 1991. Eric Red. Body Parts from last week of Bad Moon. Yeah. Oh. He shot that movie. Okay. Well, then in 1991, he also does a little film called Big Girls Don't Cry, They Get Even. <laughs> 
Wow. Okay. No, it's amazing what a what a small uh, incestuous world Hollywood is. We're not done yet. Okay. Okay. I'm listening. So then, in 1991 he, or 92, they do Wayne's World. Then they do It Was a Wonderful Life in 92. Exit to Eden in 1994. Only you and I like Exit to Eden. Then in 1995, he shoots Bushwhacked. <laughs> I love Bushwhacked. 1997, he scores um, a shooting for the practice. Then he does Volcano in 1997. Blade in 1998. Cruel Intentions, 99. Holy Big Daddy crap. in 99. Two Days with Mor- Two Days with Maury, the TV film in 99. Little uh, Nikki in 2000. Double Take, 2001. High Crimes, 2002. Out of Time, the Denzel Washington movie, 2003. Man, what a career. Little Black Book, 2004. Beauty Shop, 2005. The Riches, a short-lived TV show with Eddie Izzard in 2007. October Road, a short-lived TV show. The Hole, the Joe Dante movie in 2009. Wow, man. Grown Ups in 2010. Just Go With It, 2011. Beauty and the Beast series, 2012. Grown Ups 2, 2013. Homefront 2013. I love Homefront I with do Jason too. Statham. Yes. That's a good ass movie. Bad Santa 2 2016. Why not? Carnival Row, the Amazon Prime series uh, 2019, Bosch 2019, and he most recently shot Beautiful Wedding, uh, the sequel to, I believe, Beautiful Disaster in 2024. Wow. Yeah. That is a, quite a career. Oh, I was so happy filling this out. You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just getting to reference Big Girls Don't Cry, They Get Even. Future episode. Uh, well, damn right it will be. So then our IMDb synopsis of Wayne's World is two slacker friends try to promote their public access cable show. Their cable access public show. (laughs) My synopsis. (laughs) When their public access cable show gets picked up by a scheming TV network executive, two friends must work together to get their show back, save their friendship, and find their true loves along the way. I mean, true loves is a bit of a stretch. They both Garth up just like kisses a girl. He says, I love you, dream woman. <laughs> he doesn't even know her name. <laughs> so moving on to our cast, uh, we have Mike Myers, who plays Wayne Campbell. He started out acting in 1975 on a show called The King of Kensington. He does the series Bazaar in 79, The Littlest Hobo in 79, Wide Awake Club in 1986, which he's a writer of. Then he lands Saturday Night Live in 1989. Wow, prime uh, end of an era. Yeah, and he was also a writer on that show, of course. The Dave Thomas Comedy Show in 1990, which he's a writer on. Wayne's World in 92. Um, he's a writer on as well, or not writer, but he stars in and has some writing in it. Uh, so I Married an Axe Murder in 93. Wayne's World 2, 93, which he's a writer on. Austin Powers International Man of Mystery in 97, also a writer on that. Uh, 54 in 98. The Thin, Thin Pink Line in 98. Pete's Meteor, 98. Austin Powers The Spy Who Shagged Me, 99. Writer credit again. Mystery Alaska, 99. Shrek, 2001. Austin Powers and Goldmember, 2002. Writing credit again. View from the Top, 2003. Nobody Knows Anything. The Cat in the Hat in 2003. Ah, yes. The stories of that movie. You know that movie is basically a punishment for him, right? N- no, what for? Uh, I think his behavior on Shrek 2, if I remember correctly. That's insane, because Shrek 2 is a cartoon. Mm-hmm. So that he was just that bad in the booth. Yeah. So uh, Shrek 2 in 2004, Shrek the 3rd, 2007, The Love Guru, 2008, Finally. which he's the writer of, which I forgot about. Well, I mean, I forgot about The Love if, Guru. If he only starred in it, how could it fully kill his career? Inglorious Bastards, 2009, Shrek Forever After, 2010, Terminal, 2018, Bohemian Rhapsody, 2018, The Pen, uh, Penta Verte in 2022, which he's a writer of, and he was most recently in Amsterdam in 2022. Oh, the, that uh, that huge movie with like Christian yeah, Bale, that, Chris that, like, Rock. Yeah, kind of just I've came heard and went. Bad. <laughs> I haven't heard anything. It just kind of came and went. Yeah, no, it kind of it kind of just disappeared. Uh, Dana Carvey is our next in the cast. He plays Garth Algar. He started in Alone at Last in 1980. Has a blink and you'll miss it cameo in 1981's Halloween 2. Yeah, he plays a cameraman. He plays a cameraman. One of the Boys, 1982. This is Spinal Tap, 84. Racing with the Moon, 1984. Blue Thunder, 84. Young Lust, 84. Tough Guys in 1986, which is also the same year that he lands on SNL. So he was on SNL three years prior to Myers. I mean, I believe it. Carvey, unfortunately, Carvey doesn't really have of a massive amount of star power. He does. And that's nothing against him because he's really good. Yeah. But that's why a guy like him could totally land, like he did, land on oh, Saturday yeah. Night Live and be a massive asset for a freaking decade. Incredible. No, I mean, absolutely incredible. So he does Moving in 1988, Opportunity Knocks 91, Comic Relief 1990, uh, which he's a writer on. Wayne's World, 1992. The Larry Sanders Show, 1992. Ah, uh, the best show on television. Wayne's World, 2, 93. Clean Slate, 94. The Road to Wellville, 94. Trapped in Paradise, 1984. Dear listener, if you are a fan of Christmas movies or just goofy comedies in general, Trapped in Paradise is a movie that has Dana Carvey, Nicolas Cage, John Lovitz, all playing like criminal brothers that land in the nicest town possible that they plan to rob, except everything goes awry, but the town is so nice that like... Yeah, they're they're like so... 
painfully nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that movie. Uh, Just Shoot Me, 1998, Little Nicky, 2000, Master of Disguise, 2002, which he's a writer on, and I have a soft spot for that movie. <laughs> I would have to rewatch it. I, I remember like very little about it, except I, the turtle scene. I see, the turtle scene's great, but that also is right before when he uh, does Captain Quint, when they're chasing him, and then he's just in this little rowboat that says Orca on it, and he's doing a Robert Shaw impersonation. Fucking kills me every time. Uh, Fairly Odd Parents, 2010. Jack and Jill, 2011. Rick and Morty, 2013. Hotel Transylvania 2, 2015. Secret Life of Pets, 2016. Becoming Bond, 2017. Sandy Wexler, 2017. Secret Life of Pets 2 in 2019. And Mulligan in 2023. Oh, I haven't seen Mulligan. He, uh, I think he's on a podcast right now, too. He's got, a, I think, a podcast with David Spade. Uh, but I, th- I can't remember if Spade or Carvey, one of them tragically just lost their son to, I think, a drug overdose. Oh, God. Yeah. Thanks for keeping it light, Dave. I'm sorry. I just had to put that in there. Rob Lowe is next in our cast list who plays Benjamin Oliver. He was in New Kind of Family in 1979, Thursday's Child in 1983, The Outsiders in 1983, Class in 83, The Hotel New Hampshire in 84, St. Elmo's Fire in 85, Youngblood in 1986. Have you ever seen Youngblood, by the way? I have not. It's uh, Patrick Swayze and Rob Lowe. Uh, Swayze is a uh, very well-known hockey player who's training his brother to become like a next level. Hmm. It's really good. Uh, about last night, 1986, Masquerade, 88, Illegally Yours, 88, Bad Influence, 1990. This is a movie I need to show you. Bad Influence is James Spader and Rob Lowe, and uh, Rob Lowe is menacing to James Spader and, like, trying to, like, fuck up his life in every way possible. Like, frames him for murder, like, gets him <laughs> fired. I mean, I see... What a bummer, though. Like, I was gonna frame you for murder, and now I don't even wanna. <laughs> well, he can still get me fired. Hey. See... Dave, that's why I'm proud of you. It's the gift that keeps Be- on giving. Because you're staying positive. <laughs> Even when life is hard, you're staying positive. Speaking of hard, <laughs> The Dark Backward in 1991, the Adam Rifkin film. I need to revisit that. I have not I seen it I have not seen it in years. so long. Uh, the Finest Hour, 91. Wayne's World, 92. The Stand in 1994, the TV miniseries. Frank and Jesse in 1994. Tommy Boy in 95, which he's uncredited on, by the way. Huh, must have been like a friendship thing. Had to Because that's kind of like how um, Farley was in this movie. He's yeah. like, he was like barely in it as a gift. Well, it's like, have you ever heard the story of uh, Bruce Willis in Four Rooms? The movie Four no, Rooms? No, sir. So he is a big part of uh, one of the stories towards the end of the film, and he had to get his name removed from casting because he did it as a favor to Quentin, and SAG was like, uh, do that, and we're going to charge you, basically. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's complex. SAG is a very complex thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Larry Sanders show 1995 Mulholland Falls 1996 Living in Peril in 97 this is one we need to watch because I haven't seen it but it's Rob Lowe is a tenant to uh, James Belushi who apparently is like a psychotic landlord like puts cockroaches in apartments uh, tries to like kill him multiple times I'm listening I haven't seen it but I, I need to I, we need to track that down Austin Powers International Man of Mystery 97 Contact 97 Crazy 6 97 Spy Who Shagged Me 99 Dead Silent The West Wing Jane Doe Gold Member The Christmas Shoes View from the Top Salem's Lot Jiminy Glick and La La Wood I forgot there was a 2004 Salem's Lot Oh man it's not bad Rugger Hauer plays um oh what is that vampire's name I can't think, but Rugger Howard's the main baddie in it, and it's really good. And Donald hmm. Sutherland's in it. It's it's a solid, solid remake. Gotta hand it to Rob Lowe. Uh, people don't even talk about that little incident, incident. in his career. Yeah. Uh, 105 credits, by the way. Yeah. yeah. It's, <laughs> when you have it, an incident like that. <laughs> is, his, uh, is his underage sex tape on IMDb? It is not. No. What the hell? But thank you for smoking in 2005. <laughs> Stir of Echoes, The Homecoming. There's a direct-to-video Stir, Stir of Echoes sequel, by the way. I might, maybe I thought I'd seen it. Well, I showed you Stir of Echoes recently with Kevin Bacon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, this is uh, twenty uh, two thousand seven. The Homecoming is uh, what it's called. He does Family Guy in two thousand seven as well. The Invention of Lying, Parks and Rec, I Melt with You, Behind the Candelabra, Californication, Sex Tape, The Interview, Moonbeam City, Monster Trucks, The Orville, Super Troopers Two, The Pentaverte, The Simpsons, and he's currently on nine one one Lone Star. Oh, well, good for him. Yeah. No, he's he's really he's done a lot in these last like couple decades. Well, yeah, I mean, when he appeared on Parks and Rec, he had a his character was perfect oh, in yeah. Parks and Rec. No, absolutely. So, what was your first time seeing Wayne's World, uh, dude? I, honestly, Wayne's World was so ubiquitous, I couldn't tell you. you. Couldn't tell. I couldn't tell you if it was rented or if my teenage sister had bought a copy. I, I, I couldn't tell you. It was on so often. It was one of those tapes you could get at McDonald's, by the way, too. That's probably how I got it. That's what I was. I was wondering if that was it. I I, actually, that's probably exactly 
why I had a VHS copy. Yeah, and the only reason I know that is because uh, my parents told me that uh, whoever ran our McDonald's in Troy, he refused to sell that tape because he didn't uh, go with its values, but it was fine selling Ghost, and I can't remember what the other McDonald's tape was well, at that Well, for the record, Wayne's World is PG-13. It is, and so is Ghost, though. Yeah, but Ghost is not for kids, and it's obvious. Wayne's Ghost. World, as I'm evidence to, and you are too, <laughs> kids like. Kids like, yes. And it is not appropriate. But they got a video game, so, you know, they're attracting kids. And a great video game. <laughs> Dream close up. Whoa! My first time seeing Wayne's World, um, I was I was aware of this movie because I saw the sketch more than I uh, uh, more than I saw the film originally. Um, the movie came to me via a friend's house, but it was one of those times where it's like you have a movie on, but you're doing other stuff, so you're not really paying attention to it. So I knew about the movie. It, like, well, like, what were you doing? Were you like losing your yellow belt? Or I can't. Something? Rem- God damn you. <laughs> <laughs> the way that I really got into Wayne's World was we were on vacation in Florida and we were staying with my grandparents that were in a really nice RV park and the they had like a, a center there where you could go in and get like, you know, you could warm up food. There were videotapes you could rent. There were books, all this stuff. A cantina. Cantina. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to get a movie. So I went and got uh, Wayne's World because originally I wanted to get the 1989 Batman, but they had they had this card system that was just like in a box that you open it up and that's how you like rented it out. And when I took the Batman card out, it basically said not Batman and it was something else had been recorded over it. And it was nice. it was legit the actual like tape, <laughs> like cover and everything. So I was like, okay, well I'll do Wayne's World. And I just remember being completely in love with this movie from start to finish. And then it also gave me Alice Cooper. So I have to give props to that. And I'll never forgive this film for as mean, long as I live. That's fair. But I, I've watched Wayne's World more times than I can count. I I freaking love this movie. Good on you. I, I it, it's a great movie. What do you want? Uh, you to leave. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you ready to get into the movie? Sure, let's do it, man. All right, so we open with a Noah's Arcade commercial as we see Brian Doyle Murray, who is playing uh, Noah Vanderhup, and he is on the TV as Benjamin uh, Rob Lowe's character is watching TV with a woman. Uh, they start channel surfing, and he stumbles onto Wayne's world, and that's where we meet Wayne and Garth, and they start with extreme close-up. Whoa, yeah, the camera just zooms in and out, zooms in and out. Yeah, and very, he's very, like, silly, very silly humor. And he's immediately, like, struck watching this. He's like, okay, what is this? I've got to gotta watch more. And that's when they introduce Ron Paxton, who is the inventor of the suck cut. It certainly does suck. suck. It sucks while it cuts. <laughs> so uh, Wayne breaks the fourth wall, introducing us, or excuse me, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. So they introduce the suck cut, and that's when they are going to demonstrate it on Garth. And so he puts it on Garth, and Garth is in hell immediately. <laughs> yeah, it's very painful. <laughs> They've got the uh, get a load of this guy cam as Wayne's talking to Ron, and also there's a help me cam. And while Rob's watching this, uh, or Benjamin's watching this, he calls his buddy Russell, and he's like, you know, I think we've got something that we can sell to Vanderhoff. Yeah, find out who these guys are. Yeah. So that's when the show ends. And Wayne comes into us, breaking the fourth wall, introducing us to him, telling him that he's Wayne Campbell. He lives in Aurora, Illinois. And yes, it's bogus, but he still lives with his parents, but he has a pretty good life. And uh, wouldn't he love to do Wayne's World for a living? For a living. Uh, Yeah. And monkeys can fly fly out of my my butt. butt. (laughs) So then uh, he's talking to us as the Murph Mobile pulls up. And that's when we see Garth and the rest of his crew. And uh, they go and decide to put on a little Bohemian Rhapsody in probably what is the famous scene of this movie. Well, and it's literally the opening credits. Yes, it is. They're singing Bohemian Rhapsody as they're driving through Aurora slash Chicago. And they're headbanging and they're having a great time. And that is when uh, Wayne has Garth stop in front of this guitar store. And he sees that they have this uh, Stratocaster that he wants. And he tells us that... It will be mine. Oh, yes. It will be mine. And that's when we go to Stan Akita's Donuts and meet Glenn, the manager, played by, returning to the show, Ed O'Neill. Oh, man. I wonder how many times Ed O'Neill's going to end up on our show. <laughs> we'll find out for sure. <laughs> they also meet Officer Maharsky, um, and he tells them that uh, he had to stop some people that were coming into town and gave them full body cavity searches, which we'll come back to later. Oh, won't we? And that's when they go into Stan Akita's Donut Shop, and Glenn steals the camera, and he has this monologue about how, I've never done a crazy thing that night in my life. Why is it when a man kills another man in... Uh, war it's called or uh, so why is it when a man kills another man in war it's called liberty but when he does it in uh, the fit of rage it's not called passion uh, he does it in a crime of passion yeah, crime he's of passion. a murderer but when he does it for his country he's a hero he's a hero <laughs> And that's when Wayne takes the camera back. Yeah, Yeah, he literally steals the fourth wall to talk about something really dark, which I love. I love that. Every time we cut to him, he's doing that. Yeah. That's when Wayne sits down with his buddies, and that's when he sees his ex, Stacy, who's played by Laura Flynn Boyle. And apparently they recently broke up, and she presents him with a gun rack. 
Yeah, and he's just like, I don't even have a gun, let, let alone, alone many guns many to necessitate guns. an entire rack. rack. What am I going to do with a gun rack? And she's like, you don't like it? Fine. If you're not careful, you might lose me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that's when we cut to the Gasworks, which is a concert venue, and we meet Tiny, who is played by uh, the late, great Meatloaf. Ah, good old meat. Good old meat. And he said, uh, Garth asks him who's on the stage tonight, and he says, the Jolly Green Giants and the Shitty Beatles. And that's when Wayne goes, the Shitty Beatles? I've heard they're not very good. And he goes, they suck. Then it's not just a clever name then. <laughs> Great line. And that's movie. when he also tells them that the Crucial Taunt's on stage and they're just finishing their set. And that's when Wayne goes into Gasworks and he sees Cassandra, played by Tia Carrera, who is the main singer of Crucial Taunt, and immediately he is enamored with her. He falls in love. And we have Dreamweaver played, which, by the way, was uh, re-recorded for this movie specifically. So Gary oh. Weaver went back and re-recorded Dreamweaver. Gary Weaver did Gary, Dreamweaver? Gary Weaver did Dreamweaver. Or Gary Gary Wright, sorry. There's a W. It's Gary Wright, Dreamweaver. What? Do you people see what I put up with? You stop. I just wanted, no, I just want a little appreciation from the audience that I sit I in the same room myself. as you when you say Gary Weaver did Dreamweaver. Uh. Robert Nerf founded Nerf Footballs. Anyway... <laughs> <laughs> Wayne sees Cassandra, he's enamored with him, and uh, Garth is trying to make his way through the club, but this guy won't move out of his way, and he taps him on the shoulder, and he's like, you know, I need to get by, and he's like, get out of my face, you little dweeb, and throws him across the bar. And throws him. I mean, <laughs> throws tosses him. him, and he lands right on his ass. So that's when Garth decides to go to his car, and he gets a belt, and he hooks an electrode to it, goes back into the bar, taps him on the shoulder again, and then zaps this guy right across the bar. Electrocutes him. Electrocutes him. <laughs> well beyond a stun gun. <laughs> so uh, Crucial Top finishes, and that's when Cassandra gets off stage, and these guys start fighting in the bar and she gets into it and whoops both of their asses. Yeah, they're they're fighting and they accidentally knock a table over near her. So yeah. she just whoops their asses with some kind of martial arts. Yeah. So that's when Wayne meets Cassandra. She's like, hey, you're that uh, Wayne guy from Wayne's World. And he's like, yeah. And he's like, you know, it's a really interesting night. Everybody's kung fu fighting. Yeah, and then he gr he grits his teeth like right after he says, everybody's <laughs> kung fu fighting. Because uh, Cassandra goes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> have a great night. Bye. So he's like, you know, uh, can I see you again? And she's like, if you got $5, you can come to the rent party. It's at my loft. And he's like, I'll definitely be there. So they leave the gas works and uh, we see the guys driving out. They pull up nice uh, next to a really nice, I don't know if it's a Mercedes or not. I can't remember what kind of car it is, but they do the bit of, excuse me, do you have any Grey Poupon? Which is aged perfectly. Yeah. That's based on an old commercial for Grey Poupon, the mustard. Where uh, a limousine pulls up to another limousine and he rolls down the window and just asks the other limousine yep. guy riding in a limousine, pardon me, do you do have you any have Grey, Grey Poupon? Poupon? And he does, because Grey Poupon, pinkies up. So uh, my dad's buddy Jay was driving that like a similar car like that one time and apparently some kids pulled up next to him and did that and Jay just fired back, well if I did I wouldn't share it with the likes of you and just drove off. Ooh. <laughs> I wonder if, well, because I, I, my cousin and I did that to a car once. Yeah. I wish that that was us, but I can't claim it. <laughs> you can't be that. Oh, man. I, I would remember if he had said such a crappy yeah. comeback as that. Like, that's that's on par with, well, the jerk store called. They're running low on you. <laughs> so the next morning, we see Benjamin and Russell showing the show to Noah Vanderhoff, and they're showing him Wayne's World with the suck cut and everything, and they're trying to convince him to sponsor the show. And Noah's like, you know, I think it's two chimps, like, uh, I can't remember what he says exactly, but basically he says he's not sponsoring the show. And uh, that's when uh, Benjamin decides to ask me, you know, what is what is your concern with the market? And he's like, well, it's keeping up with the new releases of games. Talks about this game, Xantar, which is a gelatinous cube that eats villages. And there's a beauty to it in his eyes because every time you eat a uh, uh, chief, you ascend another level. But the beauty is you can't get to the another level, so kids keep coughing up quarters for it. Yeah, he's a real... Uh... Nice dude. Yeah, real nice dude. So after some persuasion, Benjamin gets him to agree to sponsor the show. They're going to send her the contracts, but they haven't even gotten the show yet. So they sold the yes. show before they even have it. They sold the show to a sponsor, and they haven't even spoken to the people who have the show. Yeah. So we see Wayne and Garth getting their car inspected, and that's when we find out that Wayne is also learning Cantonese because that is the uh, language that Cassandra speaks. And uh, that's also when we meet Phil again. Phil, I, miss, I glance over this. When they were doing the original credits with Bohemian Rhapsody, they come across Phil, who has partied out again. And that's when Garth tells him, if you're going to spew, spew into this. And he pulls out a little tiny cup like from a water cooler yes. and unfolds it from his pocket. And then when he doesn't, he just puts it back puts in Puts it back pocket. in. And uh, Phil talks about, you know, you should have been in the gas works the other night. You know, well, there's this band, Crucial Taunt. They had a babe. And he's like, Phil, we were there. Like, we what are you talking there about? with you, man. While this is happening, Garth is playing with a 
drill of some kind, <laughs> a sander, right? Or what is it? No, it, it's it's literally. Oh, it's a, the, to remove the freaking lug nuts. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a, it's a power, power wrench. Yeah, power wrench. Call. Wow, I mean, I'm not I'm not a man. Yeah. So anyway, he uh, he starts playing with it and then just scratches the shit out of this car. <laughs> yeah, like really, really badly. <laughs> so they leave, and that's when uh, we see that uh, Ben and Russell have gone to the TV station Aurora to find where Wayne and Garth are. They find out their location and they meet them at their house at the end of the show, and that's when. Uh, ben takes Garth and uh, Wayne out and tells them that basically he wants to sponsor the show. He wants to buy the show from them and have Noah be the sponsor and that he's going to give them $10,000 to $5,000 uh, uh, to $5,000 cash years. Well, checks. the way he sells it is he says like, well, I told them you wouldn't even be interested yeah. in money because you guys are artists. But he sent me with these cashiers checks for $5,000 yeah. each. He's selling them so perfectly. Well, and he also I mean, says it's, it's really sneaky. He's a big fan of the show. He has all their shows on tape. Yeah, he's, he's just the buttering way, them up. The way up. he sells it is he's like, so he asked me, what is this Wayne's World? So I pulled out a tape from my collection. I have all I'm your a shows. very big fan. Wayne's. I've taped them all. Yeah, he's, no, he's such a snake. No job. And we should mention too that while they're at this bar, uh, Garth gets this gargantuan like thing of sangria, like that has like five straws and it's just basically a punch bowl. And uh, while that uh, Ben basically tells him, like, you know, here's the contract. If you want to read over it, Wayne starts reading over it. He drops his pen to the floor and he's like, you know, it doesn't this seem weird. Like, did you ever see that Twilight Zone episode where that guy agreed to have his uh, tongue cut the guy out? Guy signed a contract and they cut out his tongue and the tongue wouldn't die. It just and pulsated it just kept and pulsated made baby and growing tongues. and then it made little baby tongues. That is not a real Twilight Zone episode. I know because I searched for so long. I can't believe you've never seen that episode. Shut up. <laughs> So they go to their patios, and that's when he lies to them, hands them the checks, and they agree to do it. So then Wayne and Garth pull up to Cassandra's law for the rent show, and they're saying, we got $5,000. We got $5,000. So they meet up with their crew inside, which, of course, Russell is there, and they're like, you know, hey, guys. And he's like, ah, what's going on? Party, guys. And he's just not fitting in, unfortunately. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> So that's when uh, they uh, go into the they go into the club. They find their friends, and they also find out that Stacy's there too. Well, she's always around. She's always around, and that's when again uh, Dreamweaver kicks up, and Wayne is just looking at Cassandra, and she's wailing on the guitar. And that's when Benjamin also lays eyes on Cassandra as well. Yep, him and his slick back rat hair. So she finishes up her set, and uh, Ben goes to meet her, trying to say that he's looking for a musical act for the show, and he'd love to talk to her. And she's like, you know, we got flyers at the door. And that's that. <laughs> yeah. I, I love how she kisses people off. He's like, could I, could I call you sometimes? She's like, you can come to my next show. That's all she's got to say. So Stacy, by this point, uh, wants to get through to Wayne. So she goes to Garth, who's standing in line at the bathroom, which did you hear the woman say, uh, the voiceover? It's like, how long have you been waiting here? Like an hour. Like this line is backed up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, Garth is like, you know, maybe you should just, you know, let it go. Get over it. And she's like, let it go. Get over it. Okay, I'll do that. Well, he says, see, date someone date else. someone else. Yeah. So she grabs the first guy she sees. Meanwhile, Wayne goes up to Cassandra, asks if they can go talk somewhere and that's when they go to the roof and he wins her over by speaking Cantonese to her. Yeah, she's very impressed by his accent. Yeah, tells but, her that she's beautiful. But then they also end up having this long dialogue about his ex-girlfriend <laughs> yes. where she's basically like, you shouldn't feel bad, just leave her. Like, yeah. You're done. Because that's when Stacy comes up to the roof making out with this guy and then she ends up falling through this window and they land on a couch right next to Phil. Yeah, yeah, it's a very... <laughs> uh, Mature comedy. <laughs> Very mature comedy. And that's when uh, he basically wins Cassandra over and she tells him that uh, he can call her anytime. So Wayne has officially gotten the girl. Well, but can he keep her? Can he keep her? We're going to find out. So next we see Wayne and Garth sitting on the hood of a car and Garth is humming the uh, whistling the, the theme to Star Trek and Wayne is just obsessed with Cassandra and they go on a little joke about how if uh, in Latin she would be Babia Majora and Garth goes if she was a president she'd be Abraham, Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln. Uh, and then Garth goes and asks, did you ever find Bugs Bunny attractive when he put on a dress and uh, act like a girl bunny? <laughs> <laughs> and he just laughs like, yeah. what? Uh, no. And he's like, uh, me either. Me either, yeah. And that's when we see the plane fly over them, uh, revealing that they're parked right in front of a landing strip, and this is what they do. Giant planes fly over and land. Because it scares the hell out of them. scares the hell so out of them. so loud. And, and yeah. So the next day, Russell's showing them around the studio and showing them the proper hand gestures for counting down, which is uh, five, four, three. three. They're like, you didn't say two or one. He's like, oh, well, you don't. Yeah, you you want to take this? You don't. Well, I mean, it's it's just old television standards because you don't want uh, the reverberation of your voice to be on when they go live. Yeah. So that's when uh, they look out over the set and they see that Wayne's basement has been built 
on a set. Yeah, they recreated his basement, which made me laugh because I was like, okay, so the original basement was a set, yeah. and then they built a recreation of that set that's also a set, yeah. so you can see the edges, you can see the lights, you know, it's a TV studio. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was very, very funny. And you got Garth Line that's like, uh, well, we're looking down on Wayne's basement, but that's not Wayne's, Wayne's basement. basement. And Wayne goes, Garth, that was a haiku. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, they look at Wayne's basement set, and that's when uh, Ben calls them over. Uh, ben calls over, and he says that he wants to bring Vanderhoff and his wife over for a rehearsal. And uh, Russell's like, you know, I don't think that's a good idea. And he's like, okay, we'll see you soon. <laughs> Hangs up. And uh, that's when we see that Wayne and Garth are in front of a blue screen as it comes down. And we see that they are doing green screen to show that they're in New York, Hawaii, Texas, and, of course, my Delaware. favorite, Delaware, yeah. which is, hi, uh, we're, we're in, in Delaware. Delaware. <laughs> So uh, that's when Garth uh, has a meeting with uh, Mimi and Noah, and you know they're like, you know, how do you like it? And he's like, well, it's kind of like a fresh pair of underwear. At first, it's constricting, but then you just kind of get into it. You get used to it, and then you can't imagine life without it. And uh, that's when Noah meets Wayne, and uh, Wayne and uh, Noah are talking on the couch, and Noah says this thing about how his new commercial was a rap song, which is uh, Combust a Move, where the games are play. It's hip, it's fresh, it's Noah's Arcade. And he goes, you know, what do you think of that? And he goes, uh, Sphincter says what? And he goes, what? What? He's like, you're right, right on. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I think about it. So the next day, Garth wakes up to play hockey with Wayne, and he wakes up by his dog coming into the room that has the same hairstyle as him. Yes. <laughs> and and every trashy girl uh, of the 90s. <laughs> every time I see that dog, I kind of think of Tina Turner with the hairstyle. <laughs> well, that's not okay, but all right. Oh, my gosh. Would you stop? What? So uh, they go outside, and they're going to play hockey in the street, which is a hilarious scene because they keep moving the net because cars keep yeah, coming car. down the street. Game on. Game to this on. day I make that joke. Oh, yeah. If I'm in if I'm like on a street and I have to move out of the way, I always go, car. Yeah. Game on. <laughs> game on. And that's when Garth questions to Wayne, you know, do you think Benjamin is one of us or is he just acting like it? And he goes, you know, that's a good call. Benjamin wants to be friends with us, but you know, we don't we, or wants us to be liked by everybody. But Led Zeppelin did songs, you know, that, that nobody liked. He wants us to basically be the Bee Gees. Yeah, he, he was says. like, they did songs that not everybody liked. They pretty much left that to the Bee Gees. Left that to the Bee Gees. <laughs> so that's when Stacy rides by on her bicycle and she's like, Hi, Wayne, and looking over at him and then smashes right over the hood of a car. <laughs> yeah, and, and and she's already wearing a neck a brace neck from brace the last fall, horrible yeah. injury. Yeah. And so she uh, she falls and he, uh, stands up and he's like, she's okay. And that's when they go, game on, yeah, game, <laughs> game on. on. So uh, the next day uh, we see Russell talking to uh, Benjamin because he uh, tells him that they want to give Noah Vanderhoff a regular spot on the show. And he's like, you know, I told that to Wayne and he didn't seem very receptive to it. And he's like, well, he'll just have to accept it. And he's like, oh, I'm sure he will. Not. Not. And then he's like, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. Excuse like, it was, me. It was an accident. Yeah. yeah. So then uh, we see Garth is working on a robot in the basement of the, st or on the, on the bottom floor it's of the studio. It's an arm. Yeah. An arm of a robot. The arm of a robot. Yeah, yeah. And that's when uh, Ben comes down and goes, you know, I heard that you uh, heard about Noah being on the show. And he's like, you know, how do you feel about that change? And Garth goes, we fear change. And that's when the robot starts spassing out. <laughs> and he's wearing this helmet with like cameras on it and yeah. stuff. It's really fun. The robot starts spassing out and he hits it with a, a hammer and that stops it. And like you said, Rob Lowe's demeanor in this scene is so good. He just plays it completely straight as this guy with the wacky head talking all weird is beating on a robot hand. <laughs> he just stands there witnessing it. So that's when we see Wayne and Cassandra driving in the car and um, he shows off that he got a CD player with the money that they got and that's when they go to the guitar store because he wants to see Excalibur which is the 64 Fender Stratocaster that he's been eyeing. And we also see Garth is in the store with them and he does a 30 sec uh, 36 second drum solo that's pretty awesome and that's really him playing by the way. No it isn't. He's a really good drummer. Dana Carvey's an amazing drummer. Oh yeah? Oh yeah. Well then why, why isn't he drumming right now? I'm sure he is actually. You want to call him? Yeah, let's get him on the phone. <laughs> so that's when uh, Wayne wants to get the attention of the store associate. So he does the may I help you riff, gets the associate's attention. And he's like, I want to look at the Stratocaster. And the, the employee's like, again? And he's like, yes. <laughs> so he plays it for a little bit. And that's when they have one of the best jokes because he starts going into what would be Stairway to Heaven if it was uh, the newest 4K and, tel and I think television airings because the line they have, the music line they have on all the previous releases are not it because apparently there was a music rights issue. I mean, that I don't doubt that. Yeah. So he said, decides he's going to buy the guitar. We next uh, see that they are all back in the studio and that's when Benjamin comes down and basically says, you know, I heard you had some issues with the sponsor and that's when we get a hilarious scene because Wayne is defending that, you know, we, we don't bow to any sponsor while he's... <laughs> Eating a box of Pizza Hut. And the logo is showing. The logo's visual. Very he holds visible. the piece up. And that's when they cut to, uh, back to him and he's eating a bag of Doritos, just talking about how, you know, I, you know, I, I don't do this. But he's like, not just eating a bag of Doritos. He's talking with the logo showing. Yeah. Then he takes a bite and makes a face like, 
hmm. You know, like it's so, and then they go to Garth and he's wearing head to toe Reebok it's, gear. It's really sad. You know, people do things for money and that's just really sad. Head to toe Reebok gear. Yeah, like, like, like. <laughs> Like a, a hat and a headband. Yeah. Like just covered in Reebok gear. And then it cuts back to Wade and he's like, this whole thing is giving me a headache. And he's like, here, take, take two, two of, of these. these. And it's new print. New print. <laughs> Small. Uh, tiny. Yeah. Yellow. Yellow. Different. Different. And then he, uh, <laughs> and he's like, you know, well, people have different tastes is what Benjamin said. And, he go, and we cut back to Wade and he's like, yes, and so does the taste of a new generation holding up Pepsi. He takes a sip of the Pepsi. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. So then we cut to Stan Nikita's donut shop and that's when Wayne and Cassandra are there hanging out with Garth and uh, Wayne playing his guitar and Stan once again takes our attention because he's talking to the station manager the TV station who tells him that he was just laid off and he's like you know what I want to do and he's like I know what you want to do you want to go find that guy uh, you know look him dead in the eyes rip out his bare heart and see if it's black and show him how black it is <laughs> so it's the last thing he sees before or he, he dies. dies he's like actually I was uh, I was thinking about calling my union rep <laughs> Well, the world's a strange place. Yeah, yeah that's Ed O'Neill's Well, oh, the world's a strange place. So that's when uh, we see Garth is focusing on his dream girl again who works at the donut shop. And he's like, you know, I, I can't I, I can't figure out how to talk to her. And that's when Cassandra's like, well, why don't you just go talk to her? And then we have a cutaway to Garth having a dream that he puts Foxy daydream. Lady. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Daydream on the on the jukebox and just does a dance and gets her attention. Yeah, he just dances up to her mouthing Foxy, Foxy Lady. Yeah, doing the, 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 <laughs> the horns above his head. So next we see Cassandra and Wayne at her loft and uh, he's he's being funny with her and asking, you know, will, will she still be will be with him and love him through the phases of his life? And he goes through the the uh, what is it? The jumpsuit phase and ends, of course, with the dead and bloated on a toilet phase. Yeah, yeah. I'll go straight to Elvis Presley. And this is really just a scene to make sure that we understand that they're like just dating now yeah. because it's just this intimate scene where they're making each other laugh in bed. Wayne's in his underwear. Yeah, yeah. And he does like some silly dances and yeah, stuff when she talks on the phone with her drummer. Yeah, her drummer calls and she's trying to talk to him and Wayne goes and like she has this mummy statue that he starts humping at one point. He does the the belly uh, wave trick and then he puts on a pink bra over his shirt and does the happy birthday Mr. Mr. President. President. Yeah. So uh, that's when she hangs up and she's like, you asshole. And he's like, oh, and then jumps on her and they have the uh, pop up text of gratuitous sex scene as he goes. Excellent. Excellent. And he's literally just like barely on top of barely her. Barely on just top of her. So next, Wayne, Garth and Cassandra go to Ben's lavish 23rd floor apartment for a dinner. And what a dinner it is. They didn't even know what they were going to eat. They didn't even know they were going to eat. But my favorite part of the scene, other than this weirdness about the uh, balcony, because yeah, like on the balcony. 23rd floor, is that Garth steals the camera <laughs> yes. again and just goes, hold on a second. How can we trust this guy? You know what this place is? This is a babe dungeon. Babe lair. A, a babe lair. Yeah, yeah. A fully they, functional babe, babe lair. lair. Like, Women have, have can't hope for anything they're when they're in here. They're powers. helpless. And then he just goes and he finds like he has books on the table that say like how to get how hot to pick chicks, up women. how to pick up chicks, how to find your girlfriend. And then he looks at his day planner. And like, Look, <laughs> Thursday, purchase feeble cable <laughs> access show and exploit it. Man, I feel sorry for whoever that is. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the best part because really the scene is not. I mean, it's not, uh, that's the best part of the whole thing. Because oh, yeah. then they end up saying, like, let's order Chinese food. And that's when Rob Lowe's character reveals that he speaks Cantonese. But you also forgot Garth's last thing where he goes into his drawer, pulls oh, out the condoms, the condoms, and he goes, ribbed Rid for her, her pleasure. pleasure. Ew. Ew. <laughs> so Ben tells Wayne uh, that they're excited about the show and that he wants Garth and him to take the day off tomorrow, handing them backstage passes for Alice Cooper because he's going to be in Milwaukee. And that's when he's like, you know, I'm hungry. Anybody want to order Chinese? And he hands the phone to Cassandra, like, why don't you order? And she's like, no, whatever you order will be fine. And that's when he speaks Cantonese perfectly, orders Chinese, and wins her over because he also names where she was born at. Yeah, he figures out what her accent's from. And now, unfortunately, yeah. we follow Wayne and Garth uh, to Minnesota. We see Wayne, we see Wayne and Milwaukee. Garth uh, in Milwaukee for Alice Cooper. And that's when we also cut back to Cassandra, who's doing rehearsal with her band. And uh, Ben walks in, and she's singing a song called Why You Want to Break My Heart. And they catch eyes for a second. The rehearsal ends, and he's got the music video contract that uh, he's going to have her sign because he's going to shoot a video for her. We then cut back to Wayne and Garth who are doing a Laverne and Shirley bit as they go through Milwaukee. Why now? Why now? Why now? <laughs> You want to tell that story real no, quick? No, it's so silly. It's not even my story. I know, but no. Bill Hader, who made his his name on Saturday Night Live, yes, he did. Uh, was doing a skit on SNL. Vincent Price's Halloween party. Yeah, he was yeah. being Vincent Price. That's all I remember. Yeah, but like as he was standing there, like getting into character, Lauren Michaels, the man who who didn't start Saturday Night Live but took it to took its it. apex, yeah, walks up to him as he's about to walk and goes, "Huh, Vincent Price." 
Why now? Why now? Because it's like the 2000s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he was like, and then I'm supposed to go out and do the performance after he said that. And I, I just found that to be like the most hilarious Lauren Michaels story it's so ever. so good. So they're doing their Laverne and Shirley bit, and that's when they're like, hey, what are we doing? We got backstage pass for Alice Cooper. And that's when we cut to the Alice Cooper concert as he's doing uh, Feed My Frankenstein off of his Hey Stupid album. Wayne and Garth are enjoying the show, having a great time. And they're like, you know, we should go backstage. So they get on the stage. They're walking around enjoying themselves. And then they make a wrong turn and find themselves outside. <laughs> And that's when they see a giant limo and we see Chris Farley, who's playing a security guard. And they're like, you know, is this Alice's limo? And he's like, no, it belongs to a good friend of Alice, uh, Frankie Sharp of Shark Records, Mr. Big. And he goes on this whole tangent about how the limo has to be big because he hates to fly. He doesn't. He drives everywhere and that he's going to be coming back through Chicago on Friday. Yeah, he basically gives an entire travel itinerary. Yes, he does. And they and I love that they pointed out to other like. That that was a very helpful yeah. security guard. For a guard. security guard, he knew a lot of information. Yeah, he knew a lot of very valuable, detailed information. So then next we see uh, Garth and Wayne go in to meet Alice Cooper, and they're like putting the, holding their backseat passes up. They're like, is this cool? And Alice welcomes them in, and you know, they're like, we can't stay long. We just want to say great show and everything. And you know, do you visit Milwaukee often? And that's when Alice Cooper talks about, you know, well, I'm a regular visitor to Milwaukee, but the uh, French explorers are coming here as early as the 1600s to share with the Native Americans. Well, and, and we should point out, it's an elderly woman playing Would Alice you Cooper. Stop it! What? Leave Gam Gam alone. Wasn't that supposed to be the funny part? Is that it's like Leave it's a little Gam old lady. Gam alone. Okay, fine. I'm, but, I'm using the name that you give him, and that's how I'm <laughs> that's how I'm adjusting this right now. I, no, but I do love this scene because basically the entire time they're talking to Alice Cooper, he's just oh, a he's total history buff huge about, nerd history about buff about specifically Milwaukee. Yeah, Milwaukee, which uh, Milwaukee, was, was Algonquin, Algonquin for the good land. Yeah, and, and then his friends are like, you know, wasn't uh, wasn't this a thing too or whatever? He's just yeah, like, uh, it was Pete. Uh, yeah. That they were the they were the first state to elect three socialist mayors, and that's yeah. when Wayne goes, does this guy know how to party or what? dead silence yeah no response at all it's so good so that's when they tell him they've got to go and alice is like no no stay with us hang out and they like oh yeah we'll, we'll stay with you and hang out with you alice cooper and they drop to their knees start going we're, we're not, not worthy. worthy we're, we're not, not worthy. worthy and then alice extends his hands like, to, to, to kiss his to head, kiss, his kiss ring, the glove yeah, yeah. <laughs> so wayne and garth the next night head to the stage for the first live show of wayne's world on uh the on the new setup, I, I lost my hand thought there for a second. Sorry, oh, you never had one. It's fine. Shut up. <laughs> Wayne and Garth see their sign come out because that's when they start to realize the show is not going to be at all exact. How yeah, they thought. It, it's it's hyper polished now. They have a sign that comes down. They have a professional voiceover guy that says yeah. like "Party on, Wayne. Yeah. Party on, Garth." So uh, Russell gives Wayne his interview cards for Noah because they're going to interview Noah on the show, and that's when Wayne's like, "Hey, can I borrow your marker? I just need to make some notes." And the show starts with an announcer and a pre-recorded intro because usually it would be Wayne's World, Wayne's World, party time. But instead it's like a professionally recorded Wayne's, like, World, Wayne's World, Wayne's World, it's party, party time. time. Dun, dun, excellent. excellent. Yeah, and they it's, have it's, the announcer and they're just immediately weirded out. This is yeah, not yeah, what they it, wanted. It feels like a bizarro world yeah. and it's not at all their, their aesthetic. So they're clearly unsettled, but they power through and they welcome Noah Vanderhuff onto the show. And that's when Wayne unveils during the interview that he has written things on the cue cards. Because they insisted he take those cue cards. Yes. So yeah, he wrote a bunch of things like so this. Oh, go ahead. First no, one please. is Sphincter Boy. Sphincter And he has Boy. an arrow pointing to him. <laughs> then uh, this guy blows goats. I, I have, have proof. proof. I have proof is the chef's kiss on that. And this man has no penis. This man has no penis. <laughs> so uh, the the, <laughs> the booth is laughing up. The crowd's cracking up. And that's when you see Ben is just pissed. Yeah, well, I mean, it's almost like they're insulting the guy who's paying for the entire show. Which is what happens because Ben calls him up to the booth. He's like, you you humiliated the sponsor of the show. You publicly humiliated him. You're you're fired. Oh, and we forgot to mention when the Wayne's World logo came down, it had a giant Noah's Arcade yeah, Presents on yeah. top of it, too. Party on, Wayne. <laughs> Party on, Wayne. Party so that's on, when God. Wayne says, you're going to fire me for that? I'm, I'm out of here, and I'm taking my show with me. And Ben's like, well, we own the show now. And he's like, ah, bite me. <laughs> yeah, I do like that. Just bite me. So he leaves Garth, and they come back from break, and Garth has to go solo, and he does not do well because he's like, I'm having a uh, good time. time not. not. And just crawling uh, over the couch. And that's... Look, he just starts shaking at him. One of the friend of their friends that's in the booth, the booth is just like, remember that scene in Scanners where the guy's head explodes? And they cut to the, the close-up of him and he's just like, <laughs> like if you've, uh, if you've seen Dana Carvey's church lady, he's doing the eye thing basically. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's fair. So uh, that's when we uh, cut back to Wayne and... Uh, or no, excuse me, Ben calls Cassandra and he's like, you know, did you see the show? And she's like, well, I had a gig, but I laughed my ass off of the first minute. And he's like, well, there were some technical difficulties. We ironed it out. Have you talked to Wayne? And she's like, uh, no, is everything OK? And he's like, I was just calling to make sure, you know, the vi video shoot's still good to go. And she's like, well, we're still on. Right. And he's like, right. I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. He's basically he thought Wayne might have turned her off from yeah. him. 
So that is when Wayne and Garth are back on the airstrip again, and Garth is giving him shit. You know, he's like, "That's a that's a shitty thing you did. Like, why did you leave me? And also, like, why am I your sidekick? Why am I your dancing chimp?" Well, he's basically because he's like, I didn't know I had to run everything by you. He's like, you do, because yeah. I'm not just your dancing chimp. Yeah. You know, and and it's a great scene that is played for laughs because basically Garth finally lets out how mad he is. Yes. And the plane flies over. <laughs> so he's See, just letting out all these expletives. But you don't hear any of them. No. And then when the plane stops, he says, and then the handle breaks off. So you have to find a doctor who can remove it. <laughs> You kiss your mother with that mouth? I'm out of here. <laughs> but but the big point of that is that then it reveals how deep their friendship is because yeah. they're, he's so mad at him, but then after that, it's like they don't even want to actually part ways. Well, really. And that's also a good point, too, because that's when Garth basically you know calls out that like Benjamin is hitting on Cassandra heavy. Yeah. Like Because Wayne really doesn't know. like He knows that he's suave, but he doesn't know that there's something going on. Yeah, Garth's like, it is obvious that he is going after Cassandra. Yeah, so they split, and Wayne goes to visit Cassandra, and she's like, you know, I waited for you, you never called, you know, and he's like, well, you know, uh, well, what's going on? I think it's important to point out, like, she didn't actually say it in an accusatory way. She was like, hey, yeah. I waited up for you. Yeah, you didn't, no, she's you didn't super come sweet. Over. And he, he, Wayne is just a total d- perfect cho- choice in yeah. words. And he's like, you know, well, well, where are you going? And she's like, well, I got the video shoot with Benjamin. And he's like, oh, so you're just going to go off with him? And she's like, well, yeah, he's running the shoot. And, you know, he's like, uh, well, maybe there's obvious reasons. She's like, what are you insinuating? He's like, well, maybe he's poking you. Yeah. And she's just shocked. She's like, could you be any more insulting? Yeah, and, and he he's goes, like, yes. I can be. Yeah, I can yeah. be. Oh, it's no, it, it, it's it's definitely like he's hurt, he's so he's hurt. taking it out on her. Because, you know, the smarter way to be would have been like, hey, I'm worried that he's coming on to you. But yeah. instead he just comes at her straight up like, you know, you don't even like me. You you just want that dude. And her whole thing is she says, like, do you think that's how I get my gigs? How I get my gigs, yeah. And and that, which is a really crummy thing. And and they because they establish her character for, for how little she's really in the movie. Yeah. They establish very clearly that she's aware she's a pretty girl. She's aware everybody wants to hit on her because she's good at handling it. You yeah. know, to like how she would always be like, there's a flyer. You know, no, like she's, she's great at handling. No, it's stuff. so good, but that tells you like how much it means to her to be respected as an artist because yeah. she's not just a pretty face; she's got uh, an incredible voice, and she genuinely likes Wayne a lot. So this is oh, yeah. really fucking. No, they get along her. super well. Yeah. So uh, Wayne then comes out of comes out of her loft, and he's like, you know, I can't believe this. Like, I'm so pissed off, and he's yelling at the camera to the point where the camera turns away from, him and he's like, hey, hey, I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. So like, it, it'll be okay. You know, hey, everything's sorry, okay. Sorry. So then Wayne goes to make up with Garth at Stan's Donut Shop, which we have another introduction or another interjection of Glenn, who uh, we see Garth is playing with a donut man that he's made, and he starts stabbing yeah, him in the belly. His chest is made out of a jelly donut. Yeah, and he's like, you know, uh, Native American, you know, if you stab a guy in the dead of winter, you'll see steam rise from his body. Native Americans believed it was his soul leaving his body, and the one guy's like, that's great, Glenn. Yeah, it's great, Glenn. <laughs> so Wayne sits down, and uh, you know, he apologizes to Garth. They make up, and he's like, you know, I, I got to figure out what to do with Cassandra, and he's like, I do have an idea, and he goes and opens the door and it's just like a James Bond training sequence. There's just guys in black outfits like jumping away from fire and and, par- and coming down on ropes yeah. and like f- doing hand-to-hand combat and he's like, I don't know, I just always thought it'd be cool to open, open the door, a door. And it's just a bunch of guys training, <laughs> training like, like a James, James Bond, Bond movie. Because he's not going to use them at all yeah. and that's when uh, Garth tells him that he thinks he should go get Cassandra and he's like, well I don't think she wants me to chase her and he's like, you know I, I gotta tell you that like women love it when you chase them, like you, you need to go after her. And and I I I love this. Uh, from here on out, the movie really just flies by. It does. So that's when uh, Wayne has a fake out a couple times. He's like, "Wait, I got an idea." No, wait, wait, I got another idea. Sits down again, and he's like, <laughs> "Oh wait!" And that's when they unveil that uh, they remembered the security guard talking about Mr. Big coming back through Chicago. <laughs> so they're going to make it so that they stream to his television in his limo. They're going to broadcast a special Wayne's World for an audience of one. Yep. By and and, and Garth comes up with this massive, massive plan, plan to. Uh, redirect satellites so that it can it can land directly on his limousine. Yeah, and then he's like, "But I'm gonna need a lot of help for that. Who would help us?" And, and everybody, everybody, <laughs> everybody we've met at the yeah, shop. Officer like, Wilharski, the yeah. TV station manager, all the guys, like, and I think even Glenn's in there too. Actually. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> so that's when we see that they are off to help him. Everybody's running out, and we see Wayne speeding off to the video shoot. We see Cassandra at the video shoot, and she's got this giant python around her, and she's like, "I think the snake fell asleep." And Rob Lowe's like, "You look great. We're gonna roll now." And she's like, "Okay." So they start rolling, and that's when we cut back to Wayne, who gets pulled over by a cop, but not just any cop. Oh, my God. This is one of my favorite jokes ever since I was a little kid watching, because there, if there's ever a movie I love more than any movie in the world since I was a little a little Nino, it was a 1,000% Terminator, Terminator 2. 2. So the cop pulls him over, and he's a motorcycle cop. Yep. 
and you hear him take his helmet off and everything, but you don't see his face. And when he leans down, it is Robert Patrick, Robert Patrick from Terminator as 2. As the T-1000. And he, and he has a picture of John, John Connor. Connor. And he says, have you seen, seen this, this boy? boy? And Wade just goes, ah! And just Speeds drives off. away. And he even runs after he his runs car after for a second yeah. like he does in Terminator 2. For some reason, I always remembered that he like started turning to the liquid, but like that, that, that was never, never in the never movie. Happened, yeah, no. never in the movie. No, that was not in there. <laughs> so uh, Cassandra um, is uh, having trouble with the snake, and like she basically stops the video, and she comes down off of it, and that's when Wayne arrives at the shoot while they're talking. Cassandra Andrew wants nothing to do with him. She's like, you know, go home. I don't want anything. And he's like, you know, oh, like, is this the, you know, uh, can I uh, like convince you? And he does this really <laughs> hilarious Oscar clip moment. Yeah, where he just gets really, really emotional. And goes into the water and splashes it yeah, on his Yeah, he takes eyes. water out of a pitcher and puts it in his eyes. He goes, I love you. And, he, <laughs> and you know what the worst part is? I, I never learned, learned how to read. read. And she's like, is that true? And he's like, yeah, all of it. Well, except the not reading part. <laughs> And that's when she's like, you know, you need to go. And Ben says the same thing. And he's like, oh, right. You know, your video shoot, because he thinks it's a sham. So he's like, you know, a total sham. Yeah. If this is her video shoot, where's her band? And the band walks by like, hey, Wayne. He's like, oh, hey, guys. He's like, but, but this camera here, there's no, no film, film in this. We camera. know there's no film in this camera. Opens it. <laughs> and the film spools out. So on a film camera, it, it, it's spooled. Yeah. So when it falls out, it just keeps going and going and going, and it's very, very funny. Very funny. It just they keeps keep piling up and piling up. piles and piles, yeah. and she's like, Wayne, go home. And uh, Wayne starts walking towards his car, and Ben's like, you know, oh, it's so hard to see rejection. And he's got the snake on him, and she goes, is that you or the snake? Yeah, and then she realizes the snake is on her. It's a dick joke, It's kids. a dick joke. It's a dick joke. So then she realizes Wayne was right. Yeah. And that this guy doesn't care about her. Uh, he just wants to get a little uh, uh, something, something. So she's like, Campbell, wait up, joins him, and they drive off. And that's when we see Garth is monitoring Mr. Big's limo on his computer. Garth takes uh, the crew to the TV studio, and they're stealing the equipment back. And that's when Russell tries to stop them. And he's like, you know, uh, do you think Benjamin's your friend? He's like, Benjamin is my friend. And he's like, no, Benjamin is no one's friend. If Benjamin was an ice cream flavor, he'd be Praline Pralines and, and Dick. dick. <laughs> Pralines and Dick. <laughs> Such... A perfect. I would love to know if that was in the script or if Dana Carvey came improvised up with that. it. Yeah, I, can I see would that. love to know. I can see pralines that. and dick. Pralines and dick. And the best thing is, is that uh, Russell is like, you know, he has his flashlight on them, and then while he says that thing and wins Russell over, he grabs the flashlight, undoes the batteries. Yeah, he takes it from him and then unscrews the bottom and lets the batteries fall like it's a gun. Like it's a gun, and he holds his guys off, and he's like, "Wait, wait, okay. it's okay now." He's with us. <laughs> and, well, and and I mentioned when we were watching it, yeah, because we we glossed over because there's so much movie, yeah. Uh, at the beginning, when they're talking about having a TV show that kids will like, yeah. Uh, this character, what was the character's name again? Uh, Russell. Russell. Russell, who's the director, basically, of the of the new Wayne's World. Uh, he says, he's like, well, you know, kids will like it because kids know when you're lying to them. They want something legitimate. Yeah. And both Rob Lowe's character and uh, Noah from Noah's Arcade are just like, no kids are stupid. They do all this stuff. And But that gives you that hint that Russell's not a bad guy. He's not, yeah. And he actually likes making television. He likes making friends. And that whole part where he says not. Yeah. You know? So now he has just completely ingratiated himself yep. into the Wayne's World family. And we, we get that because they're driving the van back to the house. And that's when Terry, who was one of their buddies... Uh, uh, earlier when they had they got the five thousand dollar deal, he's like, you know, I love you, man. And he's like, I love you too, Terry. And he's like, no, no, I love you, no, man. No, but I love you, man. And that's when uh, Russell is driving the van back to their house, and uh, Terry says it, and he's like, you know, no, man, you don't get any hugs him, and almost like makes them crash. Yeah. He's like, all right, all right, I love you, I love you. Uh, uh, thank, thank, yeah, yeah. So that's when we cut back to Wayne's house, and we see that Wayne has Cassandra and Crucial Taunt set up, and uh, that's when they cut to Mr. Big's limo as we see his TV against the TV. So he's watching them, and they're like, this is a very special show for an audience of one. And, you know, Frank Sharp, if you're watching this, uh, here's the address, and that's when he introduces Crucial Taunt, and they start playing Ballroom Blitz. And boy, one of the best renditions of Ballroom Blitz I've ever one heard. One of the best. And that's when we see Benjamin is arriving in Aurora, but he gets pulled over by Officer Waharski. Yes, who... Uh, who uh, <laughs> initiates a cavity search. Body cavity search. And the, the way we see that is because he's like, wait, there's just one more thing I have to do. And, and Rob has his problem has his back to him. And we see Waharski take out his flashlight and snaps his glove. And that's when we see Rob's and Rob Lowe's face just reacts to the snapping of the <laughs> yes. glove. So Crucial Todd's playing Ballroom Blitz. And we see uh, Mr. Big's limo do a giant U-turn. Like a, a comically dangerous U-turn for such a large limousine. Yeah. So uh, that's when we see Benjamin arrive at Wayne's house. And he's clearly having some pain back there. As he's walking slowly <laughs> because he's been violated. He's been violated by an officer of the law. Damn right. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> uh, Crucial Top finishes Ballroom Blitz. They pan over as Benjamin arrives, but we also see that Frankie Sharp is in the basement, and he tells Cassandra that was a great performance. Although she's very beautiful, he just thinks it's the wrong time. So that's when she turns to Wayne, and she goes, you screwed my career, and, and Benjamin goes, I always knew you were weak. And then Stacy comes in, and she goes, Wayne, I've been pre- I'm, I'm pregnant. pregnant. That's, that's why, why I've been, been so moody. moody. <laughs> So she walks off, and then all of a sudden, every piece of equipment starts shorting out in the basement. And the house catches on fire. House catches on fire. And Wayne is pulling Garth out of the wreckage, going, why, "Why, God? God, Why? why?" And that's when we cut to Cassandra and Ben in paradise, and she's like, you know, last night was amazing. They're on a beach, yeah. Yeah, and he's he's like, like, you were terrific. You were terrific. And then he looks at the camera, he's like, you didn't really think those guys were going to win. Wayne, did you? Did you? Yeah. And that's when Wayne and Garth come from the side and they're like, as if, as if we did in the movie like this, let's do the Scooby-Doo ending. And they go, the <laughs> so the Scooby-Doo ending is uh, we see Benjamin arrive at the house again and uh, he's, uh, the Crucial Top finishes and he's unmasked as Frankie Sharp is like, you know, I saw your performance and he's like, wow, we got through. But there's just one more bit of information. Wayne goes over and unmasks. <laughs> He Rob pulls Lowe's the character. face right off of Rob Lowe, and he's this old man who was established in, earlier in, Stan in the film. Nikita's, yeah, it's a uh, where, where do I have it? Hang on, it's a uh, old man Withers, the guy who runs the haunted amusement, <laughs> amusement park. park. And I would have got away with you if you weren't for you snooping kids. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then Dana Carvey goes, "Good job, good job, Jackie." I can't do. I'm not a Scooby. And dude. then Wayne's like, "You know, let's do the mega happy ending." And he's like, "Oh yeah, that's a good one." So then Benjamin arrives again. Frankie Shark goes up to Cassandra. He's like, "You know, you're extremely beautiful. I want to tell you, I saw your performance, and uh, I think." It was so good. I want to sign you to a six album deal, which I described as like that's hell on earth. <laughs> You're trapped. Like I said, you're dude, trapped. Weird Al had like a fifteen or twenty album contract with his with his people. Yeah, but I don't think he got it as his first deal. Uh, I think it was actually. Oh, like his first Yikes. big deal. I think I, I can't remember. I've, I've got to watch that documentary again. <sighs> anyway, so Dave, uh, you're supposed to know these things. I'm sorry. So he's got a, she's got a six album deal, and that's when Garth meets his dream woman, and she goes, "I love you, Garth," and he goes, "I love you, dream woman." They kiss. <laughs> uh, Noah is happy because kids see him in a new light, and the youngsters love him. And then Terry and Russell talk about platonic love because once again, uh, Terry goes, "I love you, man," and. and <laughs> Russell goes, I love you, because I found out that platonic love can't exist between two men. Two grown men. Two grown men. Yeah, I know, it's such a great moment. And that's when Wayne comes forward and he's like, isn't it great that we're all better people? And that's when they break into a fish face and just start doing goofy things. Because yeah, well, the idea is they, they hook, they gotcha. Yeah, they oh, hooked you. Oh, we gotcha. Yeah. We hooked you on that one. <laughs> and uh, that's when they start cutting to the credits. But then we have a mid credit sequence where Wayne and Garth are sitting back in the basement. Wayne tells me, you know, he, we, we hope you enjoyed the movie. You found it whimsical and, and inspiring. And Garth goes, I hope, I just hope you didn't think it sucked. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get another yes, post credit sequence. Yes, a final post credit sequence. So the credits have ended, and we cut back to Wayne and Garth, and they're just sitting on the couch flipping magazines, looking bored. And uh, <laughs> it's when Garth goes, you know, I don't think they're going to tell us when to leave. And Wayne goes, yeah, good call, Garth. Yeah, they're probably going to finish the credits and just fade out to black, which is exactly what happens. And then we hear Garth go, I can't believe they did that. It was It's such a great way to end the movie. <laughs> and that, my friends, is 1992's Wayne's World. Party time. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> so, oh, so so good. We both have a lot of of, of affection for this film, yes. obviously. So, Dave, what is uh? Well, before we do the rating, you yeah. got some you got some trivia for I us. I do right? have some trivia. So this is this is some trivia. It's not fun facts, and I want to emphasize these that. facts are not fun. These facts are not fun. So, twenty million dollar budget released February fourteenth, nineteen ninety two. Valentine's Day, nineteen ninety two. Valentine's Day. How much do you think it made? <sighs> Close to two hundred. Hundred and eighty three point one million dollars. That's pretty damn good. Box office uh, success debuting at number one, eighth highest grossing film of ninety two, and the highest grossing SNL skit film of all time. Well, that is for sure. Only SNL uh, L film to this date to gross over a hundred million dollars. Damn. Yeah. Shot in thirty four days. That's uh, actually kind of fast. No, thirty four days. Uh, Bohemian Rhapsody nearly did not make it into the film. Myers desperately wanted it, but Paramount and Lauren Michaels were opposed to it. Uh, Paramount, due to the cost of it being too expensive, and Lauren wanted a more recent song. He actually wanted to go with Guns N' Roses' "Welcome to the Jungle" at the time. That would have been fun too. It would have been fun. Uh, but Myers threatened to quit the production if he didn't get what he wanted, and eventually they all came to an agreement. I am sure that's the only time that there was any kind of strife with Mike Myers. Alice Cooper came to set under the impression that he would just be performing musically and have maybe one line when he was handed an entire monologue to memorize. He was a bit surprised. However, Alice Cooper is known to be a history buff, and the scene was shot with very little difficulty. Well, plus he just did drugs. <laughs> He was out of drugs at that point. Was he, though? I think he was. I mean, you mean like he ran out of drugs that day? 
Garst lined away and about attraction to Bugs Bunny was improvised and done while the crew was waiting on the plane to fly over. Myers was laughing at something else Dana had said, but the director decided to edit Mike's laugh after the Bugs Bunny joke because it looked better than the fake laugh that he had provided previously. Ah, nice. Uh, Myers originally did not want to share the limelight with Dana Carvey. He had originally developed the Wayne character as a solo character while performing with Second City. He needed a pair to get the sketch off the ground with already established cast members, so Garth was added for SNL. Okay, wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, during the Cantonese scene, Tia, Tia Carrera had no idea what Mike Myers was saying. That's, oh, we, uh, it makes sense. Yeah. She's Hawaiian yeah. and Filipino. The Stacy and Gunrack incident was based off of a real event in Myers' life where a girl he had dated broke up with him due to his preoccupation with his comedy. A week later, she tried to reconcile by buying Myers a gun rack, an absurd joke to her that she thought he would appreciate. He did not, and the two remained apart. When the movie was released, Mike's ex viewed the film with her then-boyfriend and was mortified of the anecdote had been written in, but also that the woman was referred to as a psycho hose beast. <laughs> Myers eventually telephoned his ex, apologizing for the version of her in the film. Psycho hose beast. While filming the Bohemian Rhapsody scene, both Myers and Carvey develop pain in their necks from headbanging. This can be apparent oh, in several God, scenes yeah. in the film where both actors are trying to move their heads as little as possible. Listen, as a man who's had long hair his entire adult life and most of his teen years, mm -hmm. headbanging hurts. I don't like oh, yeah, doing this. Not at all. No, it sucks. Uh, Donna Dixon, Garth's dream girl, has been Dan Aykroyd's wife since 1983. Yeah. It's almost like being rich does stuff. Weird, huh? Yeah. And finally, according to Spheris, uh, Myers was a nightmare to work with. Such events on the set included him being infuriated about not having any margin for his bagel, so he flipped the snack table over in a rage and stormed off to his trailer. Oh so my... About margarine? About margarine. You know, but... That's just one person goes to the corner store and you've got margarine now. Spheris ended up putting her daughter in charge of making sure he had whatever snack he desired for the remainder of the shoot. He was also noted to be emotionally needy and got more difficult as the shoot went along, especially during filming a Bohemian Rhapsody scene. This is why she did not return for the sequel. It should also be noted, though, that Myers was dealing with his father dying during the filming, who actually passed after the completion of the film. I mean, that is rough, but yeah. he's also, Myers is also notoriously difficult. Notoriously difficult, but that is the end of the trivia that I have for it. So what are, you, what's your rating? Well, first I want to say thank you. Those were not fun facts. They were so not I fun appreciate facts. you preparing us yes. for it. Um, now, I, I, I'm going to be honest. I can't, I don't think I can, I don't think I can give it a buy it. You can't? Because... Unless comedy and the 90s are a major thing for you, okay. then it's definitely a rent it. But but for me, it's like, of course it's a buy it for me, but I yeah. I have so many fond memories of it. Yeah. It's not a movie that's going to change your life. It's not a movie that's no. going to that's gonna make you see the world in a better way. Yeah. And maybe my buy it's are a little bit more intense than some people's. It could be. But I definitely think it's worth watching. Absolutely. Uh, if you've never seen it, you should watch it. And I think you know, paying a rental fee would absolutely be worth it. Yeah, it absolutely would. Uh, it's a buy it for me. Wayne's World is a, a time capsule of, of of SNL movies when they were more popular, I guess you could say. <laughs> well, just that one, really. I mean, really that one. Blues Brothers <laughs> and Wayne's World are like the two successful Well, ones. they're very far apart. People very forget Blues apart. Brothers was an SNL film. 70, 79, 70, or eight, it might be in the 80s, actually. Well, wasn't there a Hans and Franz movie? No, I I'm don't think kidding. there was. But now I want one. We all do. <laughs> but uh, no, Wayne's World, it's it's so much fun. It's It flies by. There's so many jokes. There's so many just great moments of just people genuinely having fun together behind a camera, too. Mm -hmm. No, I would agree. And, Definitely. Uh, I, I think it's one of those movies that if you haven't seen it, you have to, have to, have to see this at least once. And if you do like Wayne's World, the sequel is, is just as good in yeah, my opinion. Yeah, the sequel's totally worth watching. Yeah. And speaking of recommendations, we always like to wrap up the show with a couple. I have two tonight. Uh, Bowfinger from 1999 with Steve Martin Ed Mur and Eddie Murphy. Uh, when a desperate movie producer fails to get a major star for uh, for him, Bargain Basement Film, he decides to shoot the film secretly around him. I messed that up. For him, I Bargain that. Basement Film. Yeah, I know. I, I messed up my type. It's fine. <laughs> uh, and then the other recommendation I have is 1989's Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Two rock and rolling teens on the verge of failing their class set out to, uh, on a quest to make the ultimate school history report after being presented with a time machine. I mean, that's a pretty good description, I guess. It doesn't have any hilarious errors. It does sadly. not. No, it does not. Uh, but those are pretty good recommendations. I only have one, um, and it would be to feed into the SNL thing, mm -hmm. my all-time favorite SNL movie, which is Coneheads. Coneheads. And uh, uh, not, nothing against Wayne's World. I love Wayne's World. Coneheads is a movie that I think makes you think about a lot and is a very valuable story. Yeah. So Coneheads, to me, is 
like the perfect companion. It's a similar era, similar cast, lots of laughs, but Coneheads has a, a much deeper, richer story. Absolutely does. No, and, and I think uh, Coneheads also has aged super well. I just I just watched it recently, and it still holds up. Oh, it absolutely does. Yeah. So that is Wayne's World for this week. Do you want to talk about what we got for next week? Uh... <sighs> so... This was technically our St. Patrick's Day show, and the reason that it was the St. Patrick's Day show is because, you know, we originally were thinking we were going to do a Leprechaun movie, but then we decided to do a movie where somebody does a Leprechaun impression, but that's only in Wayne's World 2. Yeah, so you were as wrong as wrong could be. But next week, we are going to be doing The Long Good Friday from 1980, a British gangster film directed by John McKenzie and starring the late, great Bob Hoskins. This is going to be a first-time watch for you, isn't it? It, it is going oh, to be a first-time watch. so excited to show you this. This is such a good flick. Okay, well, I'm looking forward to the long Good Friday. And speaking of, let me just, I dropped it. He dropped something. Uh, I dropped it like an hour ago. Oh, well. Uh, we have an email. We have an email. Awesome. Yeah, from our good buddy Patrick. Oh. Uh, Patrick wrote in with a movie recommendation. Okay. So, and since Dave is the, the plan man. Yes. I like to read these out loud. And you can email us at doyouevenmoviepod at gmail.com or contact us at doyouevenmovie.com. Uh, hi, guys. Love the show. I was wondering if you guys are planning to do uh, Surviving the Game or one of the Karate Kid movies so Dave can see how to respect your sensei. Hopefully, <laughs> he found the yellow belt by now, but I doubt it. Love the show. Thanks for the entertainment. I'll be checking out your movie recommendations. Those are always fun. Never seen Late Phases. Oh, so Patrick. Good. So yeah, good. You're, you're going to love Patrick. You'll love Late Phases. And Patrick, you're absolutely right. Surviving the Game is coming to the show. We just don't know when that's yet. That's inevitable. Yeah, it's inevitable. No, that's, that's one that we bonded over very early in our friendship. Karate Kid, I don't know if I would want to do the original or if I'd want to do two more. I know I love the original, but two is my absolute favorite. Well, first of all, and I just did watch those sequels for the first time. They're recently. good as hell. Yeah, all of them are. Yeah, but I, I love Karate Kid. Well, you also like Next Karate Kid as much as I do too. Yeah, although I haven't revisited that in a long. Oh, time. it's it's something. It is something. <laughs> that was one that was always on cable when I was a teenager. It played Disney Channel a lot growing up. Shoot. <laughs> see when I, see this is how why we're not the same. Okay. When I was a kid, Disney Channel was pay. Oh. Yeah, no, it was when I, it was at my, yeah, no, it absolutely was. Fucking rich piece of shit. I remember when Disney Channel showed Uncle Buck and it was so edited. <laughs> it's a fucking guy. Which Uncle Buck? Also coming to this show soon. Yeah, oh, of course. So, but no, Surviving the Game definitely going to happen. Surviving the Game I would love, happen. I would love to do all of the Karate Kid movies. I mean, we can make that a month. We could, yeah. We'll think about we'll think that. On that. So, we'll think on that. So thank you, Patrick. We'll yeah, definitely take those into consideration. But surviving the game, absolutely coming. Karate Kid, one of them is coming, if not all. And uh, it, again, if you want to email us, it's a do you even movie pod at gmail.com. Uh, we're going to head out now. Yes. Um, but yeah, make sure you go to do you even movie.com for all the information about everything we do and head to death cult press. If you want to get a copy of our yes. book, welcome to primetime. Uh, Freddy's nightmares companion book. We would love for you to check it out. We really appreciate all the support we've been getting. It's been awesome. So until next time, we'll see you next, next Tuesday. Tuesday. Ha, 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 ha. I hit the button wrong. <laughs>